is a setting sun, is a smoking gun, is a four letter word, I hope it hurts, love is a fatal flaw. Oh my God, this, you know, you get a new mouse and all of a sudden, like you can't, you can't find your cursor anyways. Plus I thought I was trying to be all tricky guy by changing my mouse color from the traditional gray to like a kind of a neon blue and it blends in with everything. So welcome to the party people. Good evening and welcome to Simply Cyber Live, your go-to destination for the cutting edge in the world of cybersecurity. I'm your host, Dr. Gerald Dozier, and I'm here to navigate the complex cyber seas alongside you our savvy audience of cyber professionals. I am super pumped, super pumped to have you here today. Nick Barker's in the house. What's everybody? What's up? We were listening to a little The Midnight, getting started the show here. We've got a banger of today. We're going to be diving deep into the heart of ethical hacking and bug bounty hunting. Fields are not only fascinating, but crucial in our ongoing battle against cyber threats. And who better to guide us, ladies and gentlemen, through these murky waters? Then one of the most prominent figures in the cybersecurity landscape, I am thrilled to announce and introduce to you our guest today, Katie Paxton Fear, also known as Insider PhD across her popular social media channels. Katie is not just a cybersecurity researcher, she's a beacon of knowledge and inspiration in the community to all of us. With a passion for ethical hacking and a knack for uncovering vulnerabilities that would leave most of us scratching our heads, she's carved out a niche that both educates and empowers. As documented at maltigo.com, and I can drop a link if you all want, so these aren't my words, Katie got her start in security thanks to a mentorship. Nick Barker, sit down for this one. This one's gonna blow your, your mind, okay? Your so if you have socks, remove them now because they will get blown off, okay? She got her start uh, thanks to a mentorship at a Hacker One live hacking event in 2019, where she found her first two bugs in Uber, despite it being her first time hacking. I'll repeat that. She found her first two bugs in Uber, despite it being her first time hacking. After being invited as a mentee again to Vegas during DEF CON, she realized the privilege she had. And once she got home, she started making videos, teaching others how to get into hacking. So since then, Katie has launched her YouTube channel, Insider PhD, which I know all of you already know about, but I, you know, it bears repeating for the, the person in the back who just walked in and is like, what's going on here? Okay. She has over 100 educational videos on a range of topics explaining beginner phones, tools, APIs, note taking, APIs, APIs. Mobile hacking APIs. Katie did make it a point to me before we were in the green room saying that she loves talking about some APIs. So I wanted to give it that three-peat banger on that one. She is interested in the intersection of data and web application phones and developing her understanding uh, from you know the noise that's out there. But Katie's work doesn't stop there. <gasps> If you can imagine that, she's also a lecturer molding the next generation of cybersecurity professionals with wisdom gleaned from the front lines of research and ethical hacking. Today, with you and I, Katie will share her journey, explore the nuance of bug bounties, and perhaps more importantly, offer her perspective on where the field is heading and how you can be part of this exciting future. So without further ado, you know what to do, people. You got questions, drop them in chat, put a cue in front so I know it's for me. Mods, give me a hand because it's going to be a spicy episode. And drop your Oprah emotes in chat because it's all about community, y'all. Let's go ahead and give a warm welcome for Simply Cyber's guest, Katie Paxton Fear, aka Insider PhD. Let's go get her and have a great show. Hi, Katie. How are you? I'm good. How are you? No pressure with that intro, by the way. You know, massive disappointment. No, <laughs> now, I mean, it's all I'm actually true, right? watch my videos and be like, mm, is that really deserved? Oh, my God. No, absolutely. Everything I said was 100% authentic. You could see the Oprah emotes rolling in that, like I told you, uh, the Oprah emotes is our community. Like you get you get some love and you get some love. Uh, so, yeah, I, before we get into the show, it's important to note, especially for those in the audience who are fans of the Midnight, we have a sub faction of group. Many of you who regularly attend Simply Cyber Love Live may notice that their guest always has a different background and vibe. Katie and I have discovered that we are both into. Yeah. yeah. 
So, uh, so Katie, uh, how do you, how do you describe your aesthetic? Um, so people who subscribe to me will know it's very much like pink and purple. A lot of purples, a lot of like my swag is all purple. Um, very much like outrun synth wave kind of vibes. Yep. 100, a hundred percent. I mean, like literally look at my screensaver. Like, I mean, it, it's basically oh, outrun minus yeah, the car. You know what I have in my in my thing, right? This is really on brand. Um, I have got an outrun lava lamp. Oh, that's awesome. There's my lava lamp. Can you I, I yeah, I can't. Oh, I do see that. Oh, that's fantastic. I love it. I love it. Oh, such a good time to be alive, Katie. Uh, with this, with this, th a massive amounts of all this. I see the questions rolling in. I had questions already lined up for Katie, but you guys uh, are just taking over the show. So Katie, you ready to uh, have some engagement and have a good time? Yeah, absolutely. All right. Please ask yeah. me questions. I, I will. And normally I would ask you like, oh, how'd you get your starter? Can we tell a little bit about you? But I really, a lot of people already know you and that intro, I feel like covered it. So we don't have to, we can just skip the, uh, you know, having the, the way to read the wine list and just dive right into the main course, right? Yeah, sure. I mean, I have kind of like a fun, fun kind of side story about like how I ended up in cybersecurity. Because I always tell people I ended up in cybersecurity by accident. Yeah, well, let's hear it. How did you end up in cybersecurity? Everybody's got an origin story. Uh, I was, so I worked as a programmer for a company. It was a sales company. And I was walking to work one day and I realized I really hated my job. I I was getting paid money. It was my first job out of university, but I hated it. I loathe going into work every day. Um, and I decided I'm going to go apply for a PhD. Unfortunately, I had this realization in like November, long after PhD deadlines are closed. Yeah. And there was only one PhD for me to do. <laughs> but that's how I ended up in doing cybersecurity, kind of accidentally falling into cybersecurity. That is that is funny. And I, I do want to say shout out to you and, and for anyone else. Like, I feel like, w you know, when you have that uh, not epiphany, but like when you realize you'd rather walk by the door to the building you're supposed to be entering instead of entering it, it's probably time to make a change, even if it's like, you know, uh, a complete overhaul and, and ripping, ripping everything out and starting over. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I'm really glad I did it. Like, I don't think I could have survived another year working at that company. <laughs> Well, I mean, so as a programmer, because I, I, you know, I personally, you know, computer science background, I like an idiot in the early 2000s, I thought only software developer was like the, the only job you could do with a computer science degree since like I didn't have good mentorship in my undergrad that, where they could explain things. So um, so I went and became a software developer, too. And then obviously I went on to do cybersecurity. Do, do you find that your skills, which you developed as a programmer, have aided you in your in your uh, work? A hundred percent. I mean, I always say, you know, I used to make APIs and now I break them. Like I, <laughs> I, my last job, it was a very weird job. Like the first task I had at my job was to Photoshop the face of like the CEO onto a game show host okay. um, for a sales kind of like, they just need somebody who knew how to use Photoshop. So it's the first thing I did. The end of that job, I had created like a full data ingest system that would take historical data and that you could then kind of take a single like business and scrub through like a timeline of when that video business changed hands. Um, and so I learned a lot of weird skills in there. I also one one uh, day had to do like worked over the weekend uh, to plug in ethernet cables because we decided that we didn't like the <laughs> the ethernet um the the kind of cable mess um so it was a very interesting job but yeah for sure i definitely use those skills we did actually have a ransomware incident when i worked there and i knew nothing about cybersecurity. like i cannot stress how unqualified i was um, <laughs> me and the it person who again knew nothing about cybersecurity. Um, really just knew how to set up like and administer basic Windows stuff. Um, we didn't really know what to do uh, to respond to the current uh, incident that was recurring. So you know what we did? We went to the server room. We said that server's gonna be ransomware and just switched it off at the wall. Problem solved. Yeah. Can't have ransomware if the computer is off. Uh, and then we sent the entire sales floor home and cost the company like thousands in revenue because we didn't really know how to respond to it. 
Well, I mean, that is one way to respond. Uh, like th that's like the nuclear option that most people talk about not doing. <laughs> but you know what? Hey, when you don't have an IR plan, you know, anything goes. Yeah, just switch off at the wall, right? You can't have ransomware if if the server is off. No files can be encrypted. So yeah. I love it. I love it. And and just really quick before we get into uh, chat's questions here. Um, I, I love that, you know, you've said it a couple times already. I mean, you clearly work in cybersecurity now. You're clearly mentoring and helping people get in and learn. So, um, but but it sounds like, you know, you kind of had like, an, an, I'd say like a non-traditional approach into cybersecurity. And I just wanted to highlight that for a minute because at Simply Cyber, you know, we, it's a very supportive, it's a very inclusive community and we help lots of people you know, get into the industry or pivot around the industry and stuff like that. And, um, you know, a lot of people think like, oh, like I need to have, I need to have been a sysadmin or I needed to have done five years on help desk or whatever. And it, it just seems like you're another excellent example of someone who didn't take the traditional path, but through, uh, and I might be putting words in your mouth. So let me, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but through like determination, desire to want it and taking initiative, uh, you were able to navigate into cybersecurity ultimately and, and you know, continue to have a successful career. Yeah, for sure. I think there are so many different routes into cybersecurity. Honestly, the what we might call a traditional route has only really been an option for the past five years. Yeah. Like cybersecurity degrees are brand new. There weren't cybersecurity degrees when I went and got my degree in computer science. There wasn't cybersecurity courses you could really take. It was very much um a kind of you know you you kind of figure it out and for me I've always said I've always kept my mind open to possibilities especially in my career I've never always said a no like mm. as in I'm not interested in that at all I've always found if I keep my um like mind open to possibilities that actually um you'll see how many opportunities there are that maybe you wouldn't have considered one of my so i also teach real life students so one of my students one of the best students that i've taught i taught from their first year they're in their final year now um she's a nurse and she's got this entire background as a nurse and she's incredible like her work is high quality and um you can tell she has real empathy in her work and I just want to highlight, you know, there are so many skills that are not unique to cybersecurity that you can develop and then transition into or out of, right? There's, your career is never going to be as simple as saying, I'm aiming for that destination and I'm going to get there. Everybody has ups and downs in their career as they figure it out. Yeah. And, and you're, you're hundred percent right. Um, around the curriculum. Like I, so and we don't have to name ages and years and everything, but I went through my computer science degree, early two thousands, or I, gr I graduated early two thousands and, uh, s security wasn't even a class I had to take. No, me, in me neither. <laughs> like it didn't exist. Yeah. It's really weird. Cause it wasn't for me. So we recently, this is like very much academic problems. We recently got our degree reaccredited by the accrediting body. And one of their big comments was like looking at cur our curriculum, there's no cybersecurity here. And I didn't do cybersecurity. Nobody in that room that did a degree in cybersecurity, a degree in computer science had ever done uh, cybersecurity in our degrees yeah and it's just gone from being like this like niche kind of hacker thing into hey this is not just like for a career in cybersecurity. this is actually like a life skill that you need if you want to be in computing at all no matter if that's a data scientist or a business analyst all the way to like a programmer yeah well i mean even at the citadel uh where, where I, I i teach also um it he, real in light, real life people, um, the Intel major is required to take my class. So they're like, so I, I get the, uh, the opportunity and the privilege to teach kids who are being forced to take my class, not because they're interested, but because they're, they need to, but, it, but it is important. It's like a life skill. Like you said, I mean, it's, it's so, it's so ubiquitous and it's so pervasive. Mm -hmm. Everybody's got technology in their pocket now. And, you know, everybody's just like, oh, it works. Like, let's go. IoT devices, Katie, like, can those things not be insecure by default? Like, 
Oh. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I taught my mum how to hack. So my mum is not, she does not do computers, as in she lived the majority of her life with me and my brother being her, like, computer people. And I was showing her, like, how hacking works. I was literally showing her, like, a burp request. And I was like, okay, so here's what I would do. I'd change that one to a two. And her reaction from that is like, wait a second, it's that easy to hack computers. It's that easy to hack websites. And I kind of blew his mind, uh, blew her mind just because she was like, oh, uh, like I never considered how easy this was. And now my mom does think she's a cybersecurity expert though. She does <laughs> call me up and she's like, have you heard this thing on the radio? And she'll like explain it to me. I'm like, yes, it was on Twitter. Like, yesterday mm -hmm. that's awesome yeah no it, it is cool and uh, i'm glad that your mom was so receptive to uh wanting to learn like i am um... oh i paid her she was not receptive to the idea i was like i want to make this a youtube video and she's like no and i said i'll pay you for your time and she's <laughs> like no i'll pay you royalties from the youtube video and she's like, yes, okay, fine. Okay, now we're talking. And man, your mom drives a hard bargain wanting a she piece really of the action. She, you know what? After that conversation, she had this five minute rant to me about how artists, because my mom's not like she's an actual artist, like with paint, um, but how much artists get like screwed over in their careers because um, they sell a piece for the price and they don't work out royalties. And my mom was like, quality business, business decisions there. <laughs> that's too funny man that's awesome all right well let's dig into some of these questions i saw uh, a couple in here a lot a lot of questions coming in uh chris k hall regular of the uh stream good to see you christopher uh do bug bounty programs challenge traditional notions of security and vulnerability management interesting i think you can take this a couple different ways too so i'm gonna say no because i think they are part of vulnerability management nowadays right like i don't think they really challenge anything because <laughs> they're just they're considered like good practice in a lot of um areas i think what it can really do in terms of like i'm going to take in one point i'm going to take the point of like as a defender and then a point of as a bug bounty hunter as a defender it means you can essentially get pen tests more regularly right and you can have pen tests that are more chaotic um bug bounty programs don't really challenge anything about how vulnerabilities should be managed they're just a new source of vulnerabilities so the offshoot of that is that if you want to do something like a bug bounty program you need a solid vulnerability management plan like you do need a plan of like what happens when a vulnerability gets reported how does that get handled how do you see it get fixed how quickly does it get fixed how do you prioritize them etc 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 so i don't really think it does challenge for a bug bounty hunter i think it does challenge the way that security professionals work I could never be a pen tester, like absolutely not, because the idea of going through a checklist and just ticking off vulnerabilities would bore me to tears. I need the bug bounty hunting chaotic. So the um, the kind of finding random things like finding a vulnerability and just reporting it or like spending ages on a single vulnerability or spending five minutes on something and then finding it. Um, somebody like me you wouldn't necessarily be able to hire and you probably wouldn't want to for like a pure pen testing role either but it does mean that you as like a blue team can still leverage my chaotic energy in like a controlled way yeah no i mean if it works for you perfectly and and i agree 100 percent. like i i actually think um Bug bounty. Well, so a couple things. One, like traditional vulnerability management, you got to patch apps and patch operating systems, and bug bounty is not doing that. That's not so traditional vulnerability management, in my opinion. Traditional vulnerability management uh, for an organization and like bug bounty uh, pen testing stuff. Th those are two wildly different like goals and 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 kind of capabilities and functions and what they serve. So I wouldn't even say it's in the same, like it's it's not even in the same church, let alone a, just the same church, different pew. Uh, but what I would say around security, um, I, I kind of, I really enjoy 
the idea of the bug bounty programs and vulnerability disclosure programs. It has, it has taken our industry or it has taken our society, frankly, so much further uh, because the businesses are getting access to thousands of researchers where they would never, they, they maybe they would have hired one, maybe. Uh, so you're getting all that uh, additional you know, focus and eyes on and, and quality. And really, I mean, it's like a win-win because, you know, any security researcher, and, and I'd love your thoughts on this as a follow-up. I am I don't have any CVEs to my name yet. It's a career goal, a vision board thing I have that, you know, I would love one day to have a CVE attributed to me. And I always say, if you have a CVE or more attributed to you, it's, I mean, it's kind of like a gold ticket, uh, you know, like it's top of your resume. Like you can, you know, you can kind of walk into interviews and be like, look it, I got a CVE. Um, just Katie, uh, from your experience, I don't know if you have a CVE attributed to you, but I, I suspect you might just from what you've done and accomplished. I actually don't. And it's because I don't really tend to hack vendors. But also, man, the like, I don't think I want to anymore. I don't know if you you might have seen this, but some of the recent CVEs, oh my God. Oh my God. They are bad. Like, they are yeah. not security issues. So I think actually the like idea of being a, having a CVE, I don't think is where it used to be. I think the advantage of like bug bounty hunting for me is very much a case of um i kind of just chaotically hack whatever i want to hack and i get paid for it and then when it comes to like i have a different job to most people when i'm teaching students if i tell them i've hacked the department of defense i've hacked uber i've hacked they tend to listen to me because that does say hey i know what i'm talking about maybe mm -hmm. um well, depending on what your opinion of it, opinion of like the security of things like the Department of Defense are, right? Whether or not that's impressive. Um, but also being in the security community, I'm around so many like people who have like huge brains, huge thoughts, like the most intelligent people that I've ever met. And I feel very dumb in comparison. I always say that like <laughs> my version of hacking is changing a one to a two and then adding a minus in front of some numbers and that's it that's my hacking that's done that's yeah, it but i mean if it works it it works right it's it's definitely right? cool yeah oh uh, yeah and i i mean I, I yeah i'll tell you um you know like i i don't i don't feel smart or whatever but you know i feel like i'm i'm you know well read and you know whatever and there's like it's usually electrical engineers i don't know if you have the same experience <laughs> but when i'm hanging with electrical engineers i feel like a dummy i'm just like Oh my God, you guys are so smart. It's like, ah, I'll go play with my crayons over here. <laughs> my brother is legitimately a rocket scientist. Yeah. He worked at, he worked, he's like a, mecha uh, not a mechanical engineer. Oh my God, he's going to kill me. He's an aerospace engineer. Okay. Um, And he does maths. <laughs> I can't even remember what his job is off the top of my head. Oh, he'll kill me for this. You get him a um, box of chalk for holiday. <laughs> <laughs> like, sorry um but yeah so he worked like and the stuff that he does it's like he sent me one of his research papers that he was in recently and i'm like i have no idea what any of this means yeah just a lot of like um like math that doesn't actually have numbers it's just yeah. like letter math <laughs> stop doing math yeah math i watched, was never uh, supposed to look like this i saw oppenheimer on a plane recently did you see oppenheimer oh no but i really want to I oh, got, I got, I've got the book. Oh, okay. It, it it is good, but but like you know, like Oppenheimer's a theoretical physicist, so like he's like writing on a chalkboard and he's writing like you know basically like multivariable calculus type stuff and letter e's and logarithmic. But he's like writing it like you're you're like penning a tweet. Like he's just like no no no. And I'm like Jesus. I, so I was I work in like a, a department of computer science. So there are people who do like pure computer science. Um, and one of my colleagues was telling me that he was in a meeting once and the person he was sat next to um, was writing some notes. And he <laughs> he just assumed that he was writing notes about the meeting or just trying to get work done. Anyway, he leans over at the notes and um, this guy is like a physics programmer. And it is literally just an entire page of like maths and solving integrals. Not for any reason. He was just doing it for fun to pass the time during a boring meeting. Yeah, just it's, a little like a little light doodling. 
Yeah, exactly. Multivariable doodling. I love yeah, it. Multivariable doodling. Uh, so let's get back into the questions. Um, really, really quick. This isn't a question. It's just throwing some love. Chris Weaver in chat watched Thank your you. videos. Loves what you do. Chris Weaver. Good to see you, Chris. Uh, Gary Sturgiatis and Yosef, I see your question. We're going to do a segment on you in a second here. Gary Sturgiatis says, uh, what do you consider to be an entry level cyber job? That's a great question, Gary. That is a really good question. Um, anyone that will hire you. Like, I don't think that there's a really clear like path into cybersecurity because one there are routes from like being a developer where uh, your entry level cyber security job may be in like AppSec as a mid level person because you've got like the programming and the developer background. Um, I don't really think it's like stuff that doesn't have senior at the front of it, but yeah, the, I don't think there's like one or even like a few entry level jobs that I think I could just like name off. I think everyone's route and like jobs are different. Uh, my first job in cybersecurity was YouTube. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think it, it really, yeah, I think it's really clear. I think good jobs, though, like just choosing, um, say, like, I want to do red team, I want to blue, do blue team, I want to do something more on the developer side, the builder, that can be a really great start. However, if you are looking for an entry-level job, the best advice I can give you is go out and meet people. Network, 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 network. Go to events. Like, honestly, my advice is don't spend your money on getting, like, an expensive certification right out the, the like, park. Just go to networking events. Use the opportunity to chat with people. Use the opportunity to meet other people in the industry. If I hadn't have made a YouTube channel, like, and started to make YouTube videos... I would never have like got as far as I have in cybersecurity. Like that's so fundamental. And it was just, you know, during the pandemic having very little else to do. So we might as well make YouTube videos. Yeah. And I mean, I I I know I know we haven't worked together much, Katie, but like I literally I do a live stream every single morning. And part of that live stream in the intro, I explain how important networking is. It's it it cannot be overstated. Like I, I tell people all this time, like you could be the smartest cat graduating from whatever, right? So like valedictorian, whatever. And the person who's middle of the road gets the job because they know about it or the people yeah. know, or the people like a lot of jobs aren't even published. They like, yeah, I've got so many job offers from discord messages and Twitter DMS and like LinkedIn messages of people being like, we'd love to hire you, Katie, the human being Yes. rather yes. than, Hey, we've got this job necessarily. Exactly. And, and I mean, I, I know your results may vary, but like I, I'm full time in my own, I run my own business now, but my prior two jobs was a phone call and what will it take? for you, for you, Jerry, to come work, which was really, really unsettling the first time. Cause I went thinking it was a job interview and they basically just told me how awesome everything was and how I would love work. <laughs> I had the same experience. Yeah. I had the same experience. So I also, I should say, I only teach one day a week now at the university. I work uh, for like a security company full time. And I had the exact, I was like ready for this job interview. Like I've, I've done my research. I've got my prep questions and I realized I'm not the one being interviewed. Yeah. They are. <laughs> yeah, they're but selling I'm you. the interviewer. <laughs> yeah, they're selling you. Yeah. Like at the end, at the end, they're like, you know, do you have any questions? And I'm like, yeah, just one. Like, do you have any questions for me? Like, like I, I'm, I don't understand how this works. And they're like, no, no, no. We, we know what you are. And I'm like, oh, all right, cool. Yeah. So no. And, and Katie, I'm actually working on a course right now. It's more of a pet project than anything. But and the 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 title of it is ridiculous. It needs to be fixed. But the working title is how to build a cybersecurity YouTube channel to like break into cybersecurity. Like basically, like it it's so powerful having a YouTube channel and being able to that. make content and share and net and f not just because you're gonna get a job, but like for networking purposes. And uh, it really is just a really really robust. Um, it's so much. It's 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 awesome is what it is, which is why I want to make the course, you know. One of the like actual courses I teach at the university is called Ethical Hacking. Um, the final kind of 
uh, assessment for that is it's done so students take it are either degrees in cybersecurity or degrees in computer science and they choose to take it um and the the final for that course for that semester is make a piece of content for a developer audience i don't care what format it's in i've had youtube videos i've had podcasts i've had blog posts i've had a short story but your aim has to be to teach a professional audience about a security vulnerability. And I tell students, I want you to publish this. I want you to put this out, out there. I want you to go and use this as a way to start to build up your portfolio because it'll be so useful when you like actually graduate. Yeah. It, no, like way to go, Katie, empowering your students kind of like I feel like once you start doing it, it, it gets easier and easier. So like kind of getting that initial inertia, that momentum uh, is awesome. I love it. All right, I've got students who beg me to write academic essays because <laughs> they, they don't want to make content. They just want to write an essay. I'm like, yeah, sure. That's fine. Let's yeah. Or, or, or students who beg you on Twitter or, or whatever. I saw your tweet. Oh, today. man. Student, yeah. What, yeah. Can you share with chat what your students ask you sometimes? <laughs> so they're thankfully not my students, but so I I do a lot. Um, so I made a. Wait, please, uh, I'm sorry, Katie. Please keep talking. I'm going to just go off stage for a second. So yeah, please, sure, go for it. Um, so uh, I'm not going to take over the stream, but I will do this. Then I'll take over the stream. So um, I have this project called Generic University, and Generic University is an API that's like intentionally vulnerable. And I picked a university because I worked as a PhD student when I wrote it. I've now got my PhD. Um, but I, I was like, okay, I'm just gonna do something I know. I'll do like a fake change your grade system. It's really obvious what the vulnerability is gonna be. And I've done quite a lot of talks as I go through how generic university works. And what people seem to think it is, is a real university. I get, <laughs> multiple emails every week all over the world people saying I saw your video can you help me hack my grades or I'm gonna lose my scholarship if I don't keep up my grades this semester can you please hack them just that, that I, and I post them sometimes online because it's like yeah. it kind of boggles my mind but I get multiple of them a week. That's not even my first one of this week. That's the third one of this week are people like students contacting me and I I don't tend to find out where they are, but if they do send it from their student email address, I do go email their faculty and say, just so you know, this student is in crisis because it never, it never does come out of like a, it, it comes from desperation. It comes yeah. from like students struggling. So I want to make sure they get the help, but oh my God, <laughs> there's a lot of students who think I can solve their grade problems. Who would have known, who would have known that that's uh that, that, it would have been the outcome of that, of that particular course. I, I, you know, I, you mentioned earlier talking about like hacking Uber and, and getting your students attention. I find like whenever I'm trying to think through use cases, like, Oh, I'm going to give a lecture on the cyber kill chain. I'll literally say like, all right, you're going to change your grade. Like, let's go through the cyber kill chain. Like, like, you know, like, let's think through it. Like the, the action on objective is changing your grade. How do you do it? And, you know, they kind of work backwards and then they begin to realize like, oh, that we could attack you, Jerry. We could put a keylogger on your machine or we could send you a phishing email. We could fish the registrars off. Like, you know what I mean? They start uh, enumerating concepts and that, that's always this a fun is why, This is why one of the first slides I have to the students is don't hack the university. Yeah. Just don't. I don't care what your reasons are. I don't care that you are curious. Don't hack the university. And I have to say it multiple times. And you know what? There are still students who come to me every year and go, I hacked the university and now I need to disclose the vulnerability. I'm like, what did I just tell you oh my like God. <laughs> a week ago? <laughs> oh, my God. I, I guess it's it's indicative of how good you are at teaching, Katie. Uh, you, you're, you're, you're giving them the skills to be successful. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose so. Yeah, I should look at it. I should look at it that way. Oh my God. Yeah. ZMF in chat saying Threat Actor Academy, like during my morning briefs, um, you know, like you can't, you, you have to understand how the threat actors operate in order to defend against them. Right. So sometimes I'll explain their perspective. And like when there's a huge data dump, you know, I'm like, you know, if it was me, I'd take that Excel dump, 900,000 people, I'd filter by revenue or filter by financial worth and just attack the top 10. Like, why am I going to waste cycles on 
the bottom. And uh, and we always say Thread Hacker Academy to the point now where someone's registered threadhackeracademy.com and it and it redirects, I think, to uh, Barricade Cyber or one of my or one of my channels or something. But all right, uh, people have had millions of questions. Um, I definitely want to do a little bit of a lightning round. Let, let's just, uh, there's a guy in chat called Yosef. Yosef, uh, I think is here for the first time. Yosef is a nurse or it works in the nursing industry. You had mentioned your star pupil who's a nurse who's getting into cyber. Yosef has uh, lots of questions uh, and they're really, really centered around breaking into cybersecurity. Now, I want you to know, Katie, that I have some resources uh, that I've developed that because I, you know, I get asked this question all the time. And Yosef, I dropped a link to the Pivot Kit, which is basically a whole bunch of resources with videos that I've produced, pointing you to each of like how to use each of those resources. But yeah, it's a lot of work. It's not there's no easy button. Um, so to Yosef's question, Katie, when people ask you how do I break in or where do I start, uh, what you know, what would you say to that? And I'm going to be flashing Yosef's questions up as we're talking here, so people can see them. Yeah, absolutely. My number one piece of advice I can give you is do research, like figure out what it is about cybersecurity that you enjoy. And this doesn't have to be entry level stuff necessarily, right? Like it doesn't have to be, oh yeah, I'm going to get a job as a SOC analyst because that's an entry level job, or I'm going to get a job in help desk, that's an entry level job. Think about why you're passionate about cybersecurity. Why do you even want to be here in the first place? Because that is the like thing that will get you through one, the hard parts of cybersecurity that you're going to struggle with, because we all do. Um, but also give you kind of like your end goal. Next thing to do is look at those jobs, like on just job listings, see what they look for in skills. And what you'll see is that, yes, you won't have five years experience in cybersecurity. You may not have the exact, you know, whatever, the certifications they want. But actually, if you go into it, you'll see quite a lot of overlap. Now, for nursing, big thing delivering bad news you know how often like cybersecurity people have to deliver bad news to say like a, a software engineer like we've got to tell them their code is broken it's their child they've worked on it for years like that's the that's can be really hard for a developer to take um other things to consider is you know you probably have quite a lot of training in things like crisis and how to react in terms of a crisis as well. So my first port call will be figure out what you really, really enjoy, what your dream job is. That can change and it will change. Then see what kind of skills you're going to need, see what you already have and see what you're missing. And then be strategic about how you get things like certifications, right? Because ideally you don't want to pay for them yourself. Try and go into some, uh, some kind of entry-level job where Yes, you have to make a commitment to, okay, I'm going to stay with this company for three years in exchange for them paying for my training, but that can be a really great place. If you happen to live in a country where university is quite cheap and, say, like the EU, look at university as a potential option as well. Um, but again, you know, main thing is networking. Get in the cybersecurity communities as much as you can. Um, I also saw that she mentioned having... So he mentioned having a disability. Mm -hmm. There are so many virtual communities that you can be a part of that um, actually can really help if you can't necessarily, you know, get out there and actually go to events. Um, but yeah, those are my those are my top pieces of advice. It's not impossible. It's going to be hard. I'm not going to lie to you and say it's going to be easy. But if you know why you want to be in cybersecurity, you will be able to get through those hard parts. Awesome. Thank you, Katie. Um... Nerman with a super chat. We have sound effects on this show. I, I tend not to play them too often during my Simply Cyber Lives. Did we just become best friends? Yep. But that's the super chat sound effect. Um, Katie, how long did it take you to find your first bug? I know we, we mentioned in the intro about the, uh, the Hacker One Uber event, but how long did it take you to find your first bug? And what was your experience like on actually having to report it? Okay, so uh, I found my first bug at Hacker, uh, Hacker One Live Hacking Bay. If you don't know what it is, Basically, Hacker One fly out some of their best hackers to hack on essentially the most like um, mature programs that they run. These are teams that like 
these are bug bounty hunters that find criticals and teams that get criticals fixed um or sorry criticals fixed in like like 10 minutes right this that kind of level of like instant response and then there's me i was there as a mentee i knew and i can't stress how little i knew at the time like i was a developer so i know how to write code i understood what an api was um i knew what an http request was but i didn't know what they looked like i'd never seen an http request before i found my first vulnerability i'd never used bert before um my experience of vulnerabilities was maybe cross-site scripting and sql injection was probably the only two i knew at the time um and so for how long it took it took me about two hours to find my first vulnerability and most of that was trying to figure out how to um proxy traffic from an apple device to um a to burp that was that was mainly what took the time so it really wasn't that long uh but the reason why i knew i knew there was a vulnerability there um so when uh i was looking and if you've ever if you know if you're familiar with restful apis this probably won't be surprising to you but when you work with restful apis there's this lovely restful api standard this guy wrote a dissertation and really really clearly states out his goal for restful apis and everyone looked at that and looked at this dissertation this guy's hard work and then threw it out the window and yep. decided we're not doing any of that but we will take some of the like naming conventions so anyway when you develop restful apis you very rarely use the http but verbs delete or put uh delete or put you tend to just use post and get for everything even though you're not really supposed to uh and when i was testing this api i realized hang on one of these is you one of these has correctly implemented the restful api style here that's not right no developer would ever do it properly yeah um and i realized it was probably generated code rather than um like code that had been specifically written anyway so it was missing um any protection to check that you were logged in and so you could you could edit things without being logged in and that was the vulnerability i found that took me about four hours to find and to kind of i spent a lot of that trying to increase the severity of it i didn't end up doing it and then when i was testing that i found my second vulnerability which was as i was testing i was putting really large numbers in because you know when you're testing something and you just like need to put a number and you go nine 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 whatever uh apart from i realized hang on the app only lets me go up to 10 but this lets me go up to like thousand and i'm like oh okay but we put a minus number in front of it and it still worked the problem is that particular number was actually an order total um that you could make your order to be negative amounts of money mm. uh, and those are my first two vulnerabilities and in terms of like actually reporting it you know i was helped out by a mentor from hacker one and i really can't stress how great she was she is one of the smartest people i've ever met um and she has had so much hacking experience like she was one of the first people to look at the nintendo switch um and like hack it uh and when we were writing up this report we were literally writing with like 10 minutes to go before the event closed <laughs> man we were both getting stressed we were sitting there panicking and like i was sitting there my hands were going like this my hands were shaking and I was like trying to write and I'm like, I have no idea why I was, I have no idea what I need to report. Oh my God, what, what do I need to write in this thing? And then she, she's like, she's done so much hacking. She's done like years of hacking and she's getting stressed as well. Like she's getting this like stressed energy off of me and this panic as we try and report my first two vulnerabilities. Um, and then we get them in on time and she goes, right, I'm going to have a cigarette because that's way too much. <laughs> <laughs> And then someone from Hacker One came along like an hour later and was like, so just so you know, you're getting $1,000 in bounties. I'm like, no, nice. shut up. Uh, and I spent half of it on yarn at a fancy yarn shop in London. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. I love it. I love it. That's so cool. Thanks for uh, that answer, Nerm. And thanks for the question that uh, produced that response. Uh, Katie, let's do a little uh, a little uh, lightning round. Uh, yes, yeah, sorry. Okay. So, 
we, we got uh, Chris K. Hall coming back in. How many bug bounty programs have been influenced by open source software development practices? You kind of mentioned there, that RESTful API stuff. There is a fantastic um, initiative on HackerOne. I think it's just called the Open Source Security Project, I think. But it essentially is this voluntary thing where um, uh, companies can pay into a fund that goes towards bounties for open source software um but like i think in general you know bug bounty programs wouldn't be possible without open source open source is such a key element to the community and also like how we do things yeah you can see here um, I, internet bug bounty that's what it's called yeah so if you want more information on that look up hacker one internet bug bounty yeah. thank you uh katie of course, I lost my mouse again. I don't. How many monitors do you have, Katie? I. Uh, you know what? I'm only using one because if I use more than one when I talk to people, I get distracted. Uh. I'm like, oh, shiny. <laughs> the app is bouncing on the toolbar. That means I have to look at it right now. Okay. <laughs> well, at least you're self-aware, and that's pretty good. Uh, Keith Sloan, been working in IT 20 years. Company had him take a pen test course. He liked it. He's got some passion there. What do you recommend as next step be? Uh, it's completely up to you. So uh, one thing is that you could continue to do regular pen tests at your company, see if that's supported. There are a lot of really great like certifications that you can go get, like the OSCP, um, but there's also um, the the one that, uh, uh, what's it called now? My mind's gone black. The other one that is not the OSCP. <laughs> PNPT a, from TCM Academy. Yes, that's another good one. I was thinking about the one bit that I can't remember. It's fine. Okay. It's not that important. But there are there are certifications that you can do if you do want to go a bit further. There are, of course, bug bounty hunting and vulnerability disclosure programs if you want to do it in your free time. Um, I really like that as a hobby. It's a lot more chaotic than pen testing is, though. Uh, but other than that, just hack things. Oh, also Vulnhub. So uh, VonHub or Hack the Box, VonHub is free. You have to pay for Hack the Box. Um, there are like specific challenges for pen testers. You can just like have a go and try and push yourself to learn new skills. I love it. I'm gonna jump. I'm gonna jump to a question right here. Uh, Keith Sloan just dropped in chat, but I, I love the question. Uh, so, like Katie, switch places with me. So you're you're doing a Thursday live show. You're hosting. Who who are, who are you loving to to take your call and 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 agree to come on? Okay, this is going to be kind of weird. Um, there are a few cybersecurity books that are written by journalists. So Countdown to Zero Day is one. Mm -hmm. um, there is uh, uh, the one on Traces wow. in the Dark, S Sandworm. Yes, Sandworm and. Um, Nicole Penroth's book. This is how they tell the tell world end. Yes, that book's so I would good. love to interview like those three journalists because they're not cybersecurity experts, but I would just love to sit and chat with them. <laughs> like I oh. love their work so much. That, uh, I find they're so accessible. That book, the one I, I literally talk about that book probably once a week on my streams about this is how they tell me the world that ends it's it's non-fiction and it's written like a political spy thriller it's so good i re actually you know what i have a book recommendation if you like that you will probably also really like the work of john ronson he okay. is he doesn't do cybersecurity stuff he does one it's called the psychopath test and it is a look into the psychopath and like the madness industry and oh my god it's incredible and there's also my one of my other favorite books that he's written, which is um, uh, 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 shame. It's about public public shaming. So so you've been publicly shamed. Every person who decides I'm going to put myself out out on the internet should read that. That is like required reading to me on like how to deal with being shamed online. Oh my god! I, yeah, wow. Okay, so great recommendations coming from Katie here. I love it, and and great question, Keith. That that was a fun one. Uh, Nicole Palroth is is definitely on my short list of 
uh, reaches. Jen Easterly, I, I, yeah. Jenny, I mean, I'm an American, so I don't know if it matters if, since you're, you know, whatever, but like Jen Easterly, I think she's so cool. And I think she's, she's seen one of my videos before is one of like my most proud things, but British people don't get it. But Jen Easterly once tweeted at me about a video and a talk I did. Oh, uh, that's so cool. CISA. I was like, oh my God, I'm basically famous. Yeah. Yeah. That's so cool. It's like uh, cyber Beyonce. You know, it's like, yeah. It's awesome. but, but British people are like, who? Who's that? Like, yeah. Well, big deal. Big deal. Haircut Fish wants to know anything surprised you when you, that you, like anything in the industry that you've learned that was like, oh, that's uh, surprising or counter, you know, counter to what I assumed? I don't know if there was. I've always had quite an open mind around cybersecurity. I did have this realization, though, as I was learning vulnerabilities and starting to make YouTube videos on them, where I had this, like, sinking sensation whenever I made a YouTube video because I was like, oh, my God, I have written that vulnerability into so much code that's in production. Like, I don't know if, like, any of my code has actually ever been fixed or checked, but... I am I've like screwed over every like company I've worked for because I've been a terrible developer. Uh so yeah, that I think I don't know if that's quite surprised me, but it did it did cause me to have a bit of a panic every single did time. Did you submit that as a bug and try to get paid for it? <laughs> oh god, no. No, I work for the scary like I get <laughs> the person I used to work with is very, very scary. Um, I'm not gonna go too into it, but okay. he once said. Katie, don't worry. If anybody messes with you, I'm going to send the boys round. And I was like, what? Um, he's way too scary. I would never tell him his code is broken. Okay. He, he's absolutely terrifying. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Good Good to know. Uh, so ZMF says, do you really want competition now? This is in reference to earlier when I said I'm working on a class as like a side project on teaching anyone and everyone how to make a YouTube cybersecurity channel because it, it, it has opened so many doors and it's given it's given me so much personally that I, I would love for others. Katie and I were talking about this before we went live. Katie, wh what would you say if someone was like, why would you want to teach other people how to make cybersecurity YouTube content? Isn't that competition? It is, but you know, I we never see each other as competition. You know, the, the reason why I I know like simply cyber in the first place like as a show even before I came on here I knew of it was because the cybersecurity like creator community is so close knit and mm -hmm. we are all friends we all know each other we are all first to help each other out um like for example try hack me did like an advent of cyber and uh tiberius didn't get the video that he wanted to have but i had it so i was like oh yeah no problem just take this video i'll take something else instead and like I, there was no benefit to me doing that just helping out a friend yeah and that's what i really like about the community that we have you know we could easily see ourselves as competitions we're probably to be honest working in cybersecurity quite a bit competitive each other like anyway but we all want to make cybersecurity like better. We want to help educate people. You know, you, if you don't like my videos, I don't care. <laughs> like maybe, maybe you prefer other people's videos. That's totally fine. Like I don't see it as like a lost viewer that I need to fight over. I see it as, you know, there's people you vibe with and people you don't. And you know what? Sometimes you'll vibe with a YouTuber and sometimes you'll be like, meh. Not really interested. People love Mr. Beast. Can't stand him. Hate him. Never see any of his videos. I think he's too loud. But that doesn't mean that, like, <laughs> Mr. Beast needs to worry about me. So why would I worry about other people? Um, and you know what? There's space in this community for everybody. I think everyone has something to add, yeah. right? Like, nobody, uh, anyone can come in here and do something better than we're doing it. Yeah, and and I'd also like to point out, like, I, I, I 100% uh vibe with what katie's saying like they like the cybersecurity content community is co content creator community is tight-knit and very supportive uh of each other it's awesome but like I, I katie here's another thing like i do a lot of like industry stuff but like my technical practitioner stuff is all grc focused right mm -hmm. i mean I'll, I'll do grc stuff and i'll i'll play pen tester but for the most part like GRC is what you're going to get. So like if someone came to me and they're like, oh, Jerry, like do a video on API security. I'd be like, just go watch Katie's video. Like, like 
No, like there's, it's already out there. It's already made by someone who already does it better than me. It would be silly. So I, I love that we have this kind of like, um, you know, gang or community or uh, of all these different resources and people making content uh, that complements each other just as much as it um, is, you know, different. So it's, yeah, it's, it's I mean, valuable. I will always recommend other people's. I, I recommended your show, for example. So like having a daily show is something unique. Not very few people do that, and you know, you can, that's something easy to slot into your day as well, right? That's very different than sitting down and committing to my one hour ramblings about API security. And you get something different out of it. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's great. Like more people in cybersecurity, more knowledge out there. Hell yeah. So, well, and sorry, Kennedy. Anytime I cuss or swear, they're uh, on the morning briefing. We do have children that attend. Like I, I know that might sound outrageous, but there's a lot of like families that watch it together. Uh, and the first one that I ever found out about was a girl named Kennedy. And uh, so whenever I cuss, I, I, I play the beeper, and we actually have an emote for it and a hashtag and everything. So anyway, sorry, Kennedy. Um, but you said you know one hour webinar, you uh, hacking on things. I know you've got something coming up soon. Uh, it, this this event. Can you tell us about this in case people want to hack along with you? I do. Uh, so I work for a company called Traceable. We make an API security product. And as part of that, I do a lot of teaching people about API security and why it matters. And we've been doing this webinar series. We're going to do probably 10, 10 episodes um before we start talking about like stuff that's not necessarily security um so this is the fourth one uh we've currently the last three are already out we've got a video um i'm uh, sorry a webinar on like introduction to api a webinar on like um how to find apis one on uh how, like some of the security vulnerabilities did that this week the next week next uh episode is in april um, and it's going to be a hack along. So you bring your APIs, whether that's like an internal API that you maybe use as part of your job and you want to test it. You can set up your own um, little like lab environment like I'll have as well. Or you can go and pick a bug bounty program and pick something from there, bring an API and alongside we'll be going over like how to approach it, how I hack it. And I'll be showing you kind of my steps in how I would approach it. All right, and I've dropped a link down in chat so you can go register for that. Oh, yeah, it's also completely free. <laughs> yeah, free, and it's no cost. Free. free 99, that's what that's how we like to roll uh, <laughs> up here. I love it. So you can go hack with Katie. Katie, I know we only have a couple minutes left, but um, I, I wanna share with everybody uh, so many of your different uh, resources. I feel like you're most, I mean, you, you're known for your YouTube for sure, but like your Twitter account, I feel like, is uh i mean would you would you say that you're more known for your twitter account or your youtube account i technically have more followers on twitter twitter is definitely a mix between unhinged rants and like random mean posts co combined with like it's very much my personality combined with like genuine helpful advice and questions so by the way if i haven't answered like a question here you can absolutely send me questions go send me questions on twitter um i will absolutely answer them no problem but it's a lot more of my actual personality so if you want pure information youtube if you want information mixed with katie <laughs> twitter and i have linkedin which has posts i guess i'm not a big linkedin person okay yeah no no that's it's awesome you can see here uh katie just submitted the most unhinged talk she's ever written uh for steel con katie it any is. any like just i mean this is what you would get if you were following katie on twitter so you know it begs the question immediately katie what is an unhinged talk that you'll be giving at steel con potentially so if you if you've seen the meme the the one where it says stop doing math Mm -hmm. We found no use for counting higher than uh, whatever. And they're like, it's like, now they do maths with numbers for the utterly deranged. <laughs> um, and my talk is about uh, API management and how APIs like get deployed at big companies now compared to like how we still talk about APIs in like a security community. So it's kind of like 
API management and like developer stuff for the hacker uh, or actually hacking it. Oh, that's fascinating. Okay, so if you're a hacker, pen tester, bug bounty person, and you're looking at, I, I suppose, web apps, things that are in you know CI, CD, DevOps pipelines, yep. uh, it's definitely going to be a talk worth worth getting after. Um, in, yeah, so I mean, go check it out. Uh, well, it hasn't been accepted yet, right? Where is SteelCon? Uh, Sheffield in the UK. I will be at RSA. If you're at RSA, you can come say hi. I'm going to be at the Traceable booth probably for most of the time. Um, but I'm also going to be doing a talk at, at RSA on like just some fun uh, hacking stories mixed with like a uh, kind of advice for security teams trying to do security with a budget of zero and oh, what yeah. that can look like. That's always a popular topic. So if you like, and I'll just throw this out here. If you obviously, the if you work somewhere learning how to implement security, right? Like you're wearing like five hats because you're at a small business, learning how to implement InfoSec at $0 budgets, awesome. But I want to point out, if you're looking to break into the industry, like some of the things Katie's going to share at that particular talk, like that's a, that's a killer answer to like a bunch of interview questions. Like, Oh, what do you think about this? Well, you know, we could do this, which has zero cost and then blah, 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 blah. And like, you know, it, you're delivering value, you're showing initiative, you're understanding that budget's an actual thing that businesses need to work about, worry about. You can't just like buy all the things and rack them and stack them. because And not hopefully your response to a security incident won't be just turn the server off and close the business for the day. <laughs> um, you'll be more informed of what you can do when you have no idea what you're doing. Oh my God. Such a, such a brilliant way to lesson learned from Katie Pack in fear. Thank you, Katie, so much. I appreciate it. Everything. Yeah. All right. So we've been talking with Katie Paxton Fear, PhD, uh, and we've been talking about bug bounties, API hacking, her upcoming hack along. Uh, so many great things. You answered so many wonderful questions, Katie. On behalf of Chat, who has been popping off today, and all the wonderful questions, I'd like to extend my sincere gratitude and appreciation for you spending an hour with us and answering all these wonderful questions and really just delivering immense amounts of value. Thank you so very much. No, thank you very much for having me. And thank you to the mods who I'm sure have been uh, panicking all stream. It's been a really fun experience. And if you do have more questions, please just reach out. I am super open to answering questions, super open to answering DMs. Like, there you go. Katie's, you Katie's open to connect. So Insider PhD on Twitter, that's definitely the best way to connect with her. Uh, go go connect. And uh, it's called networking. I mean, that's what you're you're inviting them to do is network. I'm your first network. <laughs> I'm the yeah. first member of your network. Yeah. So get on it. It's awesome. All right. Thanks so much, everybody. And until next time, stay secure. Thank you very much, everyone. If you enjoyed that content, keep the cybersecurity train going by connecting with the other Simply Cyber community resources. We have the Discord server that's lively and always keeps the conversation going. You can connect with me directly on LinkedIn. And also every single weekday morning on the Simply Cyber channel, we're doing live daily cyber threat briefings, 8 a.m. Eastern time, as well as Thursday at 4.30 p.m. We're doing live stream interviews with industry experts, and we produce videos that we push out every Wednesday morning. I'm Jerry from Simply Cyber. I hope you enjoyed the content, and we'll see